Yeah, frankly, I uh, thought about not having much in the way of slides at all because they're actually more of a distraction than anything else. Um, so, so we started the study. The first day we were conducting it, I went down to actually observe uh, what was going on in, in the lab. And I noticed a problem right away. I, I realized we were in trouble. Um, we finished the testing for that day. We went back uh, and I spoke with the, the managers of technology transfer and we analyzed what had happened. And what I discovered was that the technique that I had used in designing that study, I had designed it using very small volumes of reagents, partly to save you know, reagent forward to maximizing the number of tests we were going to run. But the technique I had used was more of a PCR technique. It was a very precise, low volume technique. And that turned out to be very inappropriate for the QC setting that we were running this test in. Uh, what they were used to was a very high volume type of testing, uh, high throughput, um, tests that were qualitative rather than quantitative. Uh, and so my technique was, was basically inappropriate. I learned a very important lesson. Uh, and that was the importance of making sure that the scope of what I was doing, the scope of any plan or protocol I was developing, was appropriate to the setting in which it was actually going to be used. Uh, now, today I'm going to talk quite a bit about drug development. Uh, I'm not really going to talk much about IVD, but this gives you an idea of the frame of reference I'm coming from as far as uh, how I look at drug development. And it gives you an idea also of the concepts and principles that I learned from that work, and you're going to see these reflected in my talk today. So a little bit about me. I am Mallard Research. I guess I, I could say I am Mallard Research. It consists just of me. Um, I'm a uh, contractor. I've been a freelancer for about four years. Uh, primarily a bit of technical writing, uh, medical writing, uh, but the most common way I get paid, the work I do primarily for for, uh, for a paycheck is, uh, is technical assistance for IP litigation. I've done about a dozen cases, um, some in the biotech space, some in the uh, generic drug space, a few in uh, medical devices, but there have also been some tech cases as well. I've done um, network devices, I've done uh, some cases in aerospace, uh, some cloud computing, so a mixture of things, and that's kind of a, a story in itself. It's been an interesting education. But uh, my background, of course, was in IVD. I spent about 12 years uh, at a couple of different companies, and I started in R&D, did a lot of method development, uh, method adaptation, um, a bit of technical transfer, work for 510Ks. Uh, ultimately, I actually did some uh, small, small clinical studies I would travel to, to various sites. And the result of all that was it gave me a good idea about uh, what it takes to make a business like that work. Now, in, uh, in parallel with that, I had around, starting around the same time, 99, 2000, I started to pay attention to drug developers, took an interest in that. And over the years, I learned more and more about that industry, and I began to notice a pattern. I noticed that the experiences of these companies, whether it was a uh, clinical setback, a regulatory setback, or some sort of manufacturing issue, uh, the experiences these companies had oftentimes seemed familiar. Uh, I would see uh, essentially the experiences echoed the mistakes I may have made or the issues I saw or the things that happened in my own daily work. So it was a very nice parallel education, uh, and it both paths I was on over those 15 years informed uh, what I did and kind of led, sorry, sorry, kind of led me to what I'm doing today, which is, uh, you know, I use the title uh, healthcare industry analyst, and it sort of describes what I do, and that's a result of, of gaining a very good appreciation for, for the industry from those two paths that I, that I followed. Now, when I was, uh, sorry, when I was in industry, I, I one thing I learned to appreciate was having enough information. I worked very hard to accumulate all the data that I could. Uh, I would, uh, I know if I were preparing a stability study, I would use every piece of equipment that I could to, uh, to accumulate data. Uh, sometimes it was perspective, but sometimes it was just to have data points uh, that I could use, maybe in the future to correlate with any change that we may have seen in the performance of our assays. Uh, maybe when we were, for example, and other things, we'd be running a study for a method comparison between two different platforms, uh, 
what I would do is score the plasma samples we were going to use to see if any interference that were in that plasma might be responsible for the biases that we were seeing uh, between the two different instruments. So, so there was, that was a very rote thing that I did, but through all that, uh, the most important lessons I learned were very conceptual. Um, the importance of, as I mentioned, the importance of making sure the scope of what I was preparing matched what ultimately it was going to be used for. Uh, I learned about pitfalls, uh, various blind spots that you might have to look out for. Um, I learned the limitations of, uh, of data analysis. No matter how good it is, I realized sometimes uh, it's still not going to work out. So these lessons lead me into uh, what I'm going to talk about now, which is drug development. Now I'm going to say a very bad thing here, um, but here it goes. A phase three, a failed phase three, oftentimes makes the best phase two. Uh, and what I mean by that is the, when you run a phase three trial, you have a very large amount of data, a very large database. Typically, these are going to be you know, trials with hundreds of patients, maybe even thousands, a lot of different parameters, uh, maybe run for a period of many months. So you accumulate, accumulate a very large data set that when you see a failure, that allows you to actually turn around, use that to produce a protocol that has a high probability of success. Now, obviously, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to have a trail, uh, phase two trial fail. You don't set out to do that. If you're going to run a phase two, you're going to run a phase two trial. But uh, this just is an example of, of what it, the importance of learning from a mistake. I mean, what the key is when you have a failure, what does a company do with that? How do they respond? So uh, as a case study, an example of this, a really good one, is uh, the development of Pima Van Seren for Parkinson's disease psychosis. Uh, now, Parkinson's disease psychosis is, as the name implies, it's the psychiatric component of Parkinson's disease as opposed to the motor function issues that we're maybe more familiar with. Uh, There's an unmet need. Uh, as you can imagine, it has a severe effect on the, uh, on the quality of life of the patients who, uh, who experience it. So the company Acadia Pharmaceuticals was developing the drug Pima Van Seren for the treatment of that indication. Now, I'd say uh, it's targets one of the serotonin receptors. I believe there are about a dozen of them, but this one in particular, uh, 5-HT2A, was determined to be, hopefully it's them, very important uh, as far as maybe mitigating the, the, uh, the condition for these patients. So it was in phase three development about six or seven years ago, and uh, they reported the result, and it was, it, was a, it was an international trial. It was North America and Europe, about uh, 250 patients reported the result, and it failed. And now, naturally, they went back and looked at what had caused this failure. And uh, they found a number of, uh, a number of things. Uh, first observation was that in the trial, they had used three do uh, three, uh, two doses in a placebo. Now, what this did was reduce the statistical power of the data that they produced. If you have a robust result, it's great to have the option of two different doses. Uh, maybe you see one that has a little bit too much toxicity, you can choose the lower one. But in this case, it, was, uh, it contributed to a negative outcome. The, uh, the second issue was that the Parkinson's disease symptom scale actually includes 15 parameters. And of those per 15 parameters, actually only nine of them make a good contribution to efficacy. The other six are due to variability, not particularly instructive, and so that was actually muddying their data. The, the third observation they made was that they saw something very interesting happen. The trial was conducted in North America and in Europe, and what they noticed was that there was a big discrepancy between the results in North America and these European sites. Uh, in, in fact, the most significant discrepancy was between North American sites and Eastern European sites. So they did an investigation of this, and they found out that uh, you know, the clinical data quality of those sites was actually quite good of these, in the Eastern European sites. But in fact, what they were seeing was a very high placebo effect. So they investigated a little further, and they determined that, uh, and this is actually a particularly interesting finding, they determined that because these patients were in an economically challenged, socially challenged environment, it was a very rough environment, when they were brought into the trial, they were dealing with medical professionals, they were dealing with counselors. Just by being included in that trial produced a significant boost to their feeling of well-being. So the result was that, and this is interesting because this wasn't an issue of, of 
polymorphism. This wasn't an issue of pharmacodynamics. This is not an issue of, uh, you know, high toxicity reducing patient compliance. This was something outside the scope of what they've been looking at. Uh, so, so just by being included, these patients, you know, were given a support system that they didn't otherwise have. And as a consequence, that was seen as a placebo effect. So with these issues in mind, they had seen evidence of efficacy. Uh, they saw that it was, the drug was pretty tolerable. And they decided to try again. So they made another number of adjustments based on, on the things I just described. One thing was they reduced it from three arms down to two. They stuck with a high dose versus a placebo. And they actually increased the trial size by about 20%. The second thing that they did was to measure only those nine components of the Parkinson's symptom scale that were showing uh, a change, that were showing uh, a change in, the, in response to drug. Uh, the third thing was they decided to do just North America. Now, there were a couple of advantages to this. Certainly, you reduce the, the logistical costs by avoiding these additional sites around the world. You're not flying all over the planet to conduct this study. Um, also, theoretically, you might avoid the pitfall of variables that you might not anticipate by conducting the study in so many different jurisdictions. And the fourth adjustment they made was in response to the placebo issue. They introduced a lead-in period to the trial so that patients were introduced to the supportive environment before they were ever dosed before they were ever ever given a baseline. So by the time those first measurements in, were taken and this first dosing happened, that placebo effect was already factored into their study. So they, they you know, ran the study. It took about two years, and uh, it was a big success. In this case, they, it was a slam dunk. The endpoints were, I believe they hit about P.001 uh, p-value on both primary and secondary endpoints. So it worked out really well. Um, and I, I have a number of, take, um, number of takeaways from that. First of all, uh, I respect the perseverance of what they did. Obviously, there were, it was a lucrative you know, opportunity if they had success. You know, if you have a drug on the market, that's, you know, that's certainly financially a very good thing. But still, they, it's an example of a company seeing an opportunity and pursuing that and having a successful outcome. And I, 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 do, I do respect that. Another thing in that light is the adjustments they made were very elaborate. This was not a case of a you know, company doing a phase three, getting biomarker information, finding a subset where the drugs seemed to work, and then simply rerunning a very similar trial. They made a whole set of very elaborate adjustments. It was very good work that they did. Uh, it was very smart. Uh, and I think that's one of the most interesting parts of this story. Uh, also, another takeaway is the issue that they saw with the Eastern European sites. Uh, Essentially, what they did, this very much uh, echoes what I had, uh, the experience I had with my validation. The scope of what they did, their protocol, ended up not being appropriate to the context that they were actually conducting the study in. Uh, in other words, it just, it did not take into account the environment these patients were living in before they were included into that trial. So it, it was something they obviously didn't anticipate, but, but it's an important, an important lesson right there of making sure that uh, once again, that you consider potential blind spots and make sure the scope of what you're doing is going to match, is going to match what's, what's required in the context for the uh, drug or a protocol or a product, whatever is going to be used. Now, there are certainly a number of different examples of companies seeing uh, a failed phase three and trying again. Uh, Rig Assertive for MDS is a recent one. They saw a subgroup that worked, and they're going to try again phase three. Uh, there's another one, aravacycline. Uh, it's a MDR, gram-negative targeting antibiotic. They saw a good result. One of two phase threes failed, but they're going to try again. So plenty of companies will go back and, and continue development in the, in the face of a failure. But this, I think, is a particularly elegant, elegant case uh, that we see here. One other interesting thing is that it does demonstrate I think a differentiation between having good analytics and not having good analytics. And what I mean is, I, I don't literally mean that in today's setting, if you had run that first trial, they would have designed it differently and it would look like the second trial. I don't mean it literally, but 
what I do mean, I, I mean it more figuratively, more allegorically, in that in a qualitative sense, those two trials, just forget for a moment that one necessarily followed the other. Think of them as two trials with the same drug, same indication, same patient, pa patient population, and a very similar size with two very diff different outcomes. This gives you an idea qualitatively of the different outcomes you can have when you have good analysis and good information and you don't. So I'm going to move on to uh, another case. Uh, it's an interesting one. It's a particularly challenging case. Um, and context is very important for this one as well. And that's the case of uh, Etepler-Sin in the treatment of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Now, this is a very recently controversial case. It's actually a saga that's gone on for a number of years with the FDA. Uh, but recently, last month, it was approved for the treatment of DMD, and it's a very novel therapy. So uh, you might have, might have heard about this, you might not have. But uh, just a little background. Um, Duchenne, mus Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a degenerative muscle disorder. Uh, it's a genetic disease. It's characterized by the absence of dystrophin, which is a structural protein that's important for muscle development. So the absence of this, the result of the absence of this protein is that skeletal muscles don't develop properly, normal tissue is replaced by fibrotic tissue, and since it's progressive, it's, it's irreversible. Eventually, uh, a child who has this ends up in a wheelchair, and it's invariably fatal to they uh, die by sometime in early adulthood. So the, I mentioned it was a genetic disease. It results from absence of dystrophin that can result for a number of things. In some cases, it's a large deletion or a large insertion into that gene. Uh, but, some, but in about 83% of the cases, it's a much more specific error that causes it. It's actually localized to a single exon. So Etemplerson, the technology behind it, actually exploits that feature. What it effectively does in the case of a Teplerson, it targets uh, an error in exon 51. So effectively, as, as a gene is transcribed, that transcript gets spliced. Prior to splicing, what a Teplerson does, it does is actually effectively mask exon 51 so that when you end up with an mRNA and that's translated, you get a read through in the proper reading frame. Uh, and there's no, if there was a stop codon error, for example, in that exon, or a frame shift resulted in that, you know, a deletion caused a frame shift in that exon, you would get a malfunctioning protein. Well, this just skips that. It, it ignores that exon so that your protein is somewhat, it's somewhat truncated. You're losing, uh, you're losing a few amino acids, but it's hopefully maintaining a large amount of the function. Now, as you can tell, that's a very, very novel, uh, very novel approach, and that's part of the challenge. Uh, that, that you see with this is that as far as the development and regulatory aspects of, of this drug, it's, you know, it's not going to be a, a typical thing. So another challenging aspect of this particular registration program was that typically you have a phase three trial. It's going to be hundreds or maybe hundreds or maybe even thousands of patients. In the case of this drug, it was only 12. 12 patients in this study. The, the basis for approval of the CNDA was only 12. And so we typically we talk about bioanalytics. We talk about big data. We're going to think about large databases, uh, large trial populations. Um, but imagine you know, the difficulty of dealing with just 12. If analytics is a benefit and often very helpful in a very large setting where you have a lot of information to work with, Imagine how important it might be in a situation where you're dealing with 12 patients. You're going to want to conduct every study you can, or use every analysis and every way to obtain data that you can, you can imagine to, to try and make that work. Now, in the case of, of Etepler-Sin, there were two, in this disease, there are two measures that they're going to use to, to assess efficacy. One is going to be something called the six-minute walk test. As you can imagine, that's a measurement of distance walked in a certain period of time. That's muscle strength and endurance is, is what that measures. The other aspect that you're going to look at is, because it's a deficiency disease, you're going to look at the presence of dystrophin. You're going to look at how much dystrophin that this is generating. So, so that was a very, ended up being a very, very complex thing. When 
the company would present data through press releases or through company presentations, you always had to pay very close attention reading it because they did so many different comparisons trying to get as much data out of this as possible. With a six minute walk test, they would, they would present it versus baseline, versus a high baseline, a low, a mean baseline. They would present data for individual patients. Uh, they would compare it to the placebo arm, which adding to the complication was not even a true placebo. It was a placebo for three months, <coughs> crossed over to drug, and then for the following 40 months or however long it's run since, it was actually on drug. Um, they did several analyses with uh, comparing this result to the historical controls of patients out there that uh, have had six-minute walk test data but are not on any drug. Uh, now, not only the sponsor Sarepta did this, but the FDA did this as well in, in attempting to rebut Sarepta's data. So with all these parameters being looked at, an immense amount of analysis was generated, an immense amount of data from, from so very little. And if, if one wanted to do, do this, they could actually go to the briefing documents and the presentation from, uh, from the uh, advisory committee meeting and see just how, how many hours worth of graphs were presented by both sides in that. But ironically, all that ended up being basically noise. It was a lot of noise. Because for everything, for everything one, the sponsor or, or the FDA would present, there seemed to be something that was sort of suggestive in the other way. They analyzed a lot of parameters, but nothing was conclusive. And I guess that's, that's the point in that, is that for everything they did, there was still nothing conclusive in the data. It was still something where it was a toss-up. I mean, you might even consider it a fuzzy boundary, a true fuzzy boundary where you, there's, not really, there's not really a clear outcome. And so in that context, uh, now context is very important. I want to say one thing. The only reason we're talking about this, the only reason I'm talking about it, the only reason uh, it was such a controversy, the only reason the FDA didn't give it the boot years before was because of the context that this drug is in. And that's we're dealing with a fatal disease in a, in a pediatric patient population, uh, in an environment where there's a big spotlight on them, uh, a lot of attention, very heavy patient advocacy. I mean, the parents are, are very, very focused on, on getting this approved. And the result is heavy political pressure. And in that context, with, with the noise, and the noise, is, I mean noise in two ways, actually. There was that, that pressure aspect of the noise, but the, the data itself was almost statistical noise. There wasn't really much, much of value in, in the analyses that were being generated. In that context, I think two things that are very relatively small, simple things, but they, they may have tipped the scales. See, I told you I, I really don't like slides. Um, so what ended up being important was that a little dystrophin and a clean safety profile were probably what tipped the scales for this. If, I mean, they had argued about the aspect of dystrophin, whether the test results for, for the presence of dystrophin were the appropriate tests. Should you use an ELISA? Should you use Western blot? Uh, how valuable was the mRNA data? Um, how much, how much dystrophin was, was enough to make a difference for these patients? Was it even relevant to compare that dystrophin to a baseline which is essentially zero? So, so the drug did seem to be producing a little bit of dystrophin. Wasn't what investigators had hoped to see as far as enough to create a, a disease modifying effect for these patients. They had thought maybe 10 or 20 percent dystrophin compared to normal was enough to modify the disease. This was maybe closer to one or two. But it was, it did seem to be producing some dystrophin. Also, the safety profile was very clean. Now, one expert criticized that and then said, well, it's because it's a fancy placebo, an expensive placebo. You know, it's a clean safety profile because the drug is inert. Um, now, leaving that argument aside, we did seem to be seeing some dystrophin, so, dystrophin, so we'll just leave that aside. But in the scheme of, of all this uncertainty and all that political pressure, there were those two factors that, that were probably enough in that situation to tip the scales in favor of approving this drug. Now, once again, I, it was very controversial. I mentioned it was a controversial situation because it was considered to be very weak. Uh, some analysts who were, uh, 
you know, gaming the uh, chances of a successful outcome with the FDA, believed that uh, the issue of dystrophin as, as a surrogate marker was probably going to sink it because the data was so weak. And they made the point that in additional uh, other studies that have been done in this indication with recent results and recent uh, uh, FDA applications, where you had had a surrogate marker, a surrogate endpoint in muscular dystrophy, the FDA had rejected that, had rejected those applications because that surrogate endpoint data was weak. Uh, now, in one case that I, that I remember, this was pulmonary data. It was a pulmonary aspect of the disease that a company was developing a drug for. And the surrogate endpoint data was weak, so the FDA rejected it. So that the argument was that if they're going to reject these drugs that have surrogate endpoint data that's poor, just for bureaucratic or scientific consistency, they're going to, they're going to reject this. How can they possibly accept this and, and approve this drug in that setting? What, what I think they missed, though, was that this is not just some random marker. This is not a marker that was discovered through bioanalysis to correlate with efficacy. The absence of dystrophin is the defect. The absence of dystrophin is, is the problem in this disease. So if you show at least some mitigation of that, it's not the same thing as, as showing some mitigation of a comorbidity or some more peripheral aspect of the disease. You're going right to the foundation of the disease. Uh, going forward, any therapy that's going to help these patients, regardless of what combinations you use, will have some component that, that is related to supplying dystrophin to them. Now, unfortunately, this is a structural protein. It's not like a case of hemophilia where you can simply infuse or inject somebody with a protein and it works. Uh, this is something that's integrated into the muscle, so you can't do that. And the only two ways we can conceive right now of doing that are something like this, exon skipping, or gene therapy, where you simply replace or, or you know, add back, remediate the absence of a, of a functioning dystrophin gene. But, uh, but, it, but in this case, yes, certainly you were dealing with a special situation. It wasn't your typical surrogate endpoint. And I think sometimes out there when you hear clinical trials discussed and they'll talk about surrogate markers or biomarkers. Sometimes it's surprising, but sometimes it's missed that in certain cases you're not talking about just some extraneous marker, you're talking about the actual target of a drug, and it's a very different setting. Um, we talked that long, huh? Yeah. <laughs> it's a good story. Uh, there is, I could, I, there's one thing I could take about, you know, three minutes, is that okay? Okay. I want to close by talking about the uh, general idea of phase three failures. I said they fail all the time. Well, well, they do. And, and it's always kind of an interesting you know, exercise to, to look at trials that are in progress and try and gauge your chances of success. And one thing, it, when there's an upcoming clinical result, I'm going to go back, upcoming clinical result, I always do an exercise. I, I say to myself, what could go wrong? Now, there's a certain, you know, tempting fate, sarcastic aspect. You know, you might see da data that's extremely good in phase two, and your reaction might be, oh, you know, what could go wrong? The phase three is going to work. And I've seen cases that where it looked very strong, and, uh, and naturally you're going to think that, that your chance of success is very high. Uh, when I do that analysis, I, of course, I look at phase, three, uh, phase two data. I try and, you know, figure out what the chances of success are based on that. But I always ask myself what I'm missing. And there's a particularly interesting case, uh, cellumetinib in KRAS non-cell lung cancer. Now, this was, this was, result was reported in August. And this was an example of a case where the data was very strong in phase two. It was actually the star of ASCO. Uh, they had very strong, it was not a small phase two, it was about 80 patients. It was better than a lot of them. Very strong, very high, highly statistically significant. Uh, pointed to an obvious pathway forward in that disease. And so naturally, they, they went into phase three with that. Uh, and that result was going to be due in the third quarter. So I was kind of on the lookout for that. Once again, as I said, the, uh, the result was in phase two made me think that it was probably going to have a very good chance of success. But I, I did an exercise. I said, what could go wrong? And I did have a nagging doubt, and that was that they had made a change in the formulation 
between phase two and phase three. They had gone from a oral suspension to a, to a uh, capsule formulation. Now that shouldn't matter. They should have done their work, which of course they did to make sure that they were equivalent. There was bioequivalence there. But nevertheless, that was, that was a doubt in my mind. Uh, about a week later, the result was reported and it, it failed. It failed. And so at a rational level, I was surprised. The data had been so good in phase two, it didn't make sense that it was going to fail. But at an emotional level, I really wasn't surprised. Now, there's no way to know why. The company hasn't disclosed why they think it failed. They haven't, uh, maybe haven't done the analysis yet. They haven't disclosed plans going forward, whether they intend to pursue it or not. But I think what the important thing is that in this setting, a sure thing ended up failing. And whether my reason for having doubt had anything to do with it or not, there's no way to know. I mean, it could be, it had nothing to do with it. It could have been I was lucky. Maybe I was right for the wrong reasons. But I think the takeaway is that you're not necessarily going to know why, why your analysis is going to be wrong. You're not going to know why something might fail. It's important to remember that they can. You can be surprised that in the end of the, at the end of the day, no matter how good your analysis is, there are variables out there that you can't control. You don't even have access to them. And, and what seems like a sure thing can turn out to be, to be a failure. So I'll just close real quickly. Uh, you know, I mentioned the, uh, the various efforts I made to collect data. Uh, the tools we have are, are pretty impressive these days, and they're only going to get better. Uh, but at the end of the day, there are important principles to remember as far as you know, the blind spots that can cause you trouble, uh, making sure your, your scope meets your context. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, you recognize there are limits to your analysis. Uh, those lessons, I think, no matter what tools you're using, no matter what plans you're developing, no matter what data you're in analyzing, those tools, uh, if you develop a, a, an appreciation for them, I think are, are going to be very important. So I'll close with that. You know, it's one that's been quoted in a number of sources, and I haven't looked recently, but I think, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 percent, something like that. Uh, it might be that high. Um, I think that that's, I think that's partly based on, on the figure that I'm a little more sure of, which is when you have a successful phase three, um, when you, I think, I think it's about 70 percent of the time that you, uh, that you run a phase three, you have success. So I, I'm not sure that that statistic is exactly, I'm, I'm, I want to be sure that I'm not thinking about chances of approval or chances of, uh, you know, filing and successful approval after that, but I think it's about 70% success rate. Wait, is there any correlation with the, the size of the trial versus the I honestly don't know. Uh, in the example of Pima Van Seren, you had a trial that was only about 300 patients, maybe 290 patients. And the p-value there was pretty dramatic. Uh, there are other examples of studies. Uh, there was this drug for, uh, there was a phosphate binder that's used in kidney disease patients, uh, a drug called Xeranex, kind of an interesting off-the-shelf product. That trial were two phase threes, but those trials were relatively small also, uh, maybe a few hundred patients. The result there was statistical significance that was very high as well. It was like p.0001, maybe several zeros more, to be honest. It was just it was a very, very good result, but it was a small trial, so it very much depends on the setting. Well, thank you. We're going to have a break now. We'll come back at 11, yes, <laughs> and, and invite you to